podcast to talk about the merits of Sonic, a podcasting application for the Android cellular phone. For me, the Grey Rooms are a job, a project I have devoted considerable time and effort to see into completion. For you, they are entertainment. Listening to entertainment, I am told, should be easy. The Sonnet application makes it effortless to listen to horrific explorations of the human condition. They make use of a clean design and a user-friendly interface to effortlessly discover new programs, listen to your favorites, and keep up to date with the newest iteration of the rooms. Sonnet costs nothing. If this application sounds interesting, follow the link in this episode's description to discover Sonnet. And hope against hope. You do not end up in the Grey Rooms. This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. You wake, standing on the doorstep of a beautiful mansion. The front door stands open. You can hear voices, music, so many, many people. You step towards the door. You have to know what's inside. You are lost. You have no memory of how you got here. It doesn't matter. Because now, you belong to... The Grey Rooms. Season 3, Episode 13. It's always a, something of a surprise when I come back to life. <sighs> a lot of bad surprise, you know, it's just, just, just a bit shocking. You know? <laughs> oh. <sighs> oh, I've been killed so many times now, in an equal number of weird and mysterious ways, I might add. <laughs> it always, always gets kind of boring. Yeah. Ah. First time, uh, uh, well, back when I was alive and all, uh, was when I was shot in the heart by my third wife. <laughs> Oh, 
I used to be pretty mad at her after I woke up dead in the room. Uh, or not me, I guess, but uh, in looking back on it, I probably had it coming, you know what I mean? <laughs> she had caught me the legs of Kimbo with her sister and all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then you, then you know, he's like I told the Emperor, uh, my time with the project was as bad as anyone. You know? Poison, knives, chainsaws, dogs, dogs with chainsaws, scalpels, alien stingers, android finger blades. Oh, and here's one time, oh, 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 a clown with a blowtorch. Oh, not a picturesque ending to that birthday party, let me tell you. Oh. Do give me the willy. Ooh, ooh. Well, even after I retired, I still got killed all the time. An, an occupational hazard of being the warden's favourite, I suppose. <laughs> now, uh, thankfully, I, I die a whole lot less often than I used to. Uh, most nights, I can fall asleep here in my comfy little cottage in the manor grounds. I get to wake up in the same place with all my limbs and wobbly bits intact. <laughs> Make myself a nice cuppa, get dressed and uh, go into work. Uh, uh, but, uh, hmm, how did I die yesterday? <laughs> oh, right, oh, right, yeah. The Waldens. <laughs> I should have guessed. Odds on favourite. Uh, Ms. Olmer asked me to go looking for him again. I must have found him for all the good he did me. I really thought he was turning the corner, he was. I, after they pried all those chains off him and made him wear a suit. Blinking Nora. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter, because today is going to be a better day. I can feel it. <laughs> <sighs> You got a whole day ahead of you, Todd old boy. Embrace it. Breathe it in. Let's have a smasher. I'll spend most of the morning just doing my ketchup, George. You know, you know it's amazing, it's amazing to me, but remarkable even, how these immortal, infinitely powerful hell beings need someone like little old me just to function sometimes. <laughs> oh, I gave the architect's bird cage a good cleaning. <laughs> I only got a couple of scratches for me trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I helped I helped Miss Alma with one of her experiments. I'm a very good test subject, if I do say so myself. <laughs> and I kept both my eyebrows this time, which was nice. <laughs> Afterwards, I gave Lil Oz uh, Alma's doggy a nice walk. <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be a walk anyway. He got big side. You know how pups can be. <laughs> Afterwards, I had a bit of extra time to make lunch today. The Admiral was still sleeping off his last room and um, wouldn't be expecting help with his investigations until the evening. So I decided to treat myself a bit and make me and the attendants some chilli for lunch. <laughs> Oh, Alma and Bob don't actually need to eat food, of course, don't they do it you know, sometimes just to make the guests feel at ease. Or, or if old Todd slaps them, grow up and asks them nice and proper. <laughs> hmm, quite tasty. Delicious. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> oh, it's nice to be appreciated.
I make chilli the way my first wife did. Back in good old Dome 33. Dome, sweet dome. <laughs> oh, my Alice. <laughs> she was the best cook out of all of them. Taught me everything I know. Such a, a lovely caring sort she was. <laughs> I, 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 try, I, I try not to think about her much on, on account of, you know, she was the one... She was the one what broke me uh, in, in the grey room. At the time, the management said the statistical odds of a locust returning a subject to their point of origin are astronomical. That's fancy talk for the uh, rooms aren't supposed to take a guest back where they came from. But with me, lucky old me, they did. I chose a room. Inside was my Alice. I had to sit there, my ex-wife said, and watch as a maniac caught her up in a sweep. There were bad times around then. Lots of domes losing power, running out of food. Raiders got into work in domes, places full of families and good honest folk. <sighs> I was inside my sweet ex-wife's head when they brought her to their cook shop. Bodies hanging everywhere. She was so scared. And they, uh, they started cutting on her. She, she was, she was still alive when they started to eat her. Oh, I went, well, I went, I went full balmy after that, didn't I? I came out of the room screaming and swinging, went after Bob the Warden, anyway, anyone that got near me. They had to kill me, of course, and even after I came back, I was too much of a nutter to go back in the rooms. I was done for, as I guess. The first thing that, well, really drove me crazy, the thing that still sets my teeth to rattling if I think about it too much. I chose it, didn't I? You choose your door. Been how the project has worked since day one, as far as I can tell, long before I came on. So back then, I, I had another option. I, I could have chosen a different room, another death. I guess it's like the Admiral says, we are our choices when it all comes down to it. <sighs> Hello? Oh, it's you. <laughs> oh, I thought it was going to be the architect calling down to curse me out for taking a breather or something. You know how she can be. Well, it's been a couple of years now, hasn't it? Why are you asking now? Look, if they don't already know it was me to let your snake thing in, they ain't ever going to figure it out. Oh, good. It's in the usual place and out in the woods. Yep, I'm squirrelling them away for a rainy day. <laughs> Never know when you need to splash a little dosh around, eh? No, 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 nothing new to talk about, really. Uh, the Admiral's definitely talking to himself when he thinks no one's listening. Now, I, I confirm that. I'm not sure who he thinks he's seeing, but there ain't nobody there. I was thinking maybe it was my last thing... Oh, speaking of the devil, <laughs> the guest is awake. I've got to go fetch him and I'll get him sorted. Uh, we'll talk later, all right? Yeah, you too. He came in wet and sticky this time around. You get a feel after a while for which rooms will send him back in a state. His last one with a weird cup. The Admiral's a sensitive type under the skin. He came back all shaking and pissing himself. Oh, I was ready for him, though. 
Thank you again. These clothes will make for excellent replacements. I'm sorry for, well, the state I was in. Not to worry, Admiral, not to worry. I like this nice red coat on you. All quite dashing, I think. <laughs> You're good to me, Todd. I know we need to go find the attendants, choose a door, all of that. But before we do, I was wondering if I could cash in that rain check from you. Oh, your investigations again, yeah? Still eager to figure out where that creepy snake came from. <laughs> I have a theory, Todd. And, well, it's challenging. As he talked, uh, he kept glancing off to the side. He, he tried to hide it like, like, he was, you know, like he was looking at me or something. But he weren't. He was looking at something behind me. Only I knew there was nothing behind me on account that there was a mirror on the wall. Stranger and stranger. Since I regained my facility to connect to the rooms, I've been able to track the snake much better. I've walked all around this old heap, following its trail, and, well... You've been in Bob's study before, correct? In my head, I giggled a bit. Oh, I says to myself, this is where this has all been heading. <laughs> Out loud, I said, oh, yes, sir. I've been there a couple of times. Lovely place, quite cosy. What would you say if I said I had reason to believe the snake came in through the study? No, not a bob. No, he'd never. No, no, I don't think he would either. I don't think it was intentional, whatever happened. I don't believe Bob would deliberately work against the project. The problem is that right now my evidence is all circumstantial. I'm hesitant to bring it to anyone's attention. You're a good man, Mr. Beckett. You don't want to throw suspicion on Bob if you don't need to. That's quite decent of you. Thank you. Now, if you'd be willing to show me where it is, I think a few minutes in the library would prove or disprove my theory. With that out of the way, we can talk to the attendants directly. Have them bring this to management. Oh dear, our um, uh, connection with the rooms doesn't show you where it is. Then, oh, how strange. His look in his eye went hard for a moment. A bit scary. I thought I'd pushed it too far, but his look slid over my shoulder towards whatever he was looking at, and he forced himself to smile. It must still be settling down. I can't seem to find it. Even though I've been there before. Well, then, don't you worry, Admiral Beckett, sir. I don't want anybody thinking Bob might have something to do with that snake nonsense. Oh, let's get over to the North Wing and I'll show you just where it is. Oh, I even got a key to get through the locks and wards and touch. <laughs> locks and wards, you say? Oh, sure. You know how these attendants can be. Can't let just anyone go wandering into their sanctum sanctorum now, can we? <laughs> I suppose not. Well, lead the way. I nodded and headed down the hall. The Admiral followed along behind me, two little mortals and one invisible whatever it was making their way through the belly of the big scary-esque manor. Oh, I almost forgot. Bob would have my head if I didn't ask. Ask what? Do you have any favourite foods, Admiral? The numbers danced before my eyes. <sighs> Sighing, I closed the accounting file, leaned back against my chair, and cracked my back hard. <clears throat> I'd been at work for hours, trying to help the local school get back on track financially, and only realized now I was starving. I suddenly understood why I was so hungry. The air was filled with the deliciously floral and spicy scents that only Guadalupe could offer. Somewhere nearby, someone was cooking with saffron and ginger.
I went to the kitchen to whip up a quick stir fry. As I did, I noticed my neighbor slowly rocking in her chair on her back porch. Since moving down to Guadalupe a few weeks ago, I'd seen her but never introduced myself. Too busy. It seemed like she wasn't one to go out at night because of her advanced age. From afar, her looks were distinctive, with colorful, multi-layered clothing and an eccentric hairdo. Her stomach was round as a pregnant woman's belly, though I suspect she wasn't, given how old she was. I finished making dinner and realized how much I had left over, so I put some in a container to offer my neighbor, a way to make contact. I crossed my bushy yard, little more than an extension of the underbrush beyond, then opened the rusty gate between our backyards. As I did, a red jungle fowl screamed in my direction, and I flinched. I disliked birds more than I could explain. Making a wide circuit around the thing, I introduced myself to the old woman as I approached her porch. Hello, ma'am. I'm Samuel, your new neighbor. I made way too much food for dinner and brought you some, you know, to, to say hello. Her croaky voice rose in the early evening air. What makes you think I am Biongui? Maybe you can have it later. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself. I slowly climbed the porch stairs, and as I reached her chair, I couldn't help but gasp. I'd rarely seen a woman so ugly in my life. Getting myself together, I forced a smile, even as the stench wafting off her smothered the floral scents on the air. You don't have to eat it, you know. Uh, I wanted to offer you something a as a gift, but I just arrived here, and I've been working a lot. And she gave me a long look, and finally gave me a genuine smile, her teeth crooked and rotting. The woman lifted her claw-like hands to take the bowl. Why, thank you, mon cher. I am Ludwin, mon plaisir. Welcome to La Matin, Samuel. Thank you. Uh, well, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, I'm not the greatest cook, but uh, I bring it with good intentions. I bowed slightly and turned to go, wanting to get away from the horrid smell. Good night, Miss Ludwin. Good night, Cher. I was happy with my first contact outside of work odd as it might have been. As I walked home, I wondered if I'd be accepted by the rest of the community who, I was told, were quite tight-knit. Somehow, the stench from Miss Ludovine followed me home. It reeked everywhere I went, like rotten algae. Even after I closed all the windows facing her house, it still smelled. It took hours to get used to it, but I didn't complain. I spent the evening with my nose scrunched up, and as I fell asleep late that night, I was wondering what I could subtly do to help the woman. I didn't see Miss Ludovine again for days. My workload at school was constantly growing. All I noticed was the stench. It never completely faded away. As I came home late one night, I saw a beautiful ebony woman coming out of my neighbor's house. I didn't say anything the first night, but kept seeing her once in a while. Thinking it was Miss Ludovine's daughter, I waved, only getting a wry smile in return. Still, I didn't give up. I thought if she warmed to me, I could ask her to a coffee date. One evening, as I walked home after a late dinner with the school principal, I was brought out of my thoughts by a whistle that grew louder and louder until it was unbearable. I covered my ears only to see a massive ball of fire falling from the sky, directly towards my house. My heart leaped in my throat and I ran as fast as I could. When I got home, I realized with relief that neither mine nor Miss Ludovine's house had been hit. Nothing had been disturbed. I couldn't even see a wisp of smoke on the air. I could, however, 
smell that stench. It was even worse now. Still, I went to the woman's house to check on her, avoiding the usual wandering red jungle fowl in her yard. I knocked gently. Miss Montplaisir? Are you all right? The stench nearly made me gag, but I waited and waited, only to hear creaking from behind the house. I rounded the porch to find the elderly woman rocking in another chair, asleep, her round belly lifting at a slow rhythm. Good. She missed it. Crisis averted. I headed home quietly, as to not wake her, wondering what had fallen from the sky and where. Even with her everlasting stench, I cared for the woman's well-being. I wondered if her granddaughter was home. That night, my dreams were filled with screams, dancing flames, growls, the sounds of waves and algae scents, and an overall warm feeling, enough that I woke up aroused without knowing why. As I was putting my coffee on to brew, I heard screams from outside. No jungle fowl this time. Human, very real, and much louder than it was in my dreams. Dashing out my front door, I saw a disarticulated body in the middle of the road, blood on its neck and face, his skin so pale it looked translucent. I stood on the porch, observing the scene. An animal must have done this, I told myself. But what kind of animal can crack bones and slash throats like that? A shiver ran down my spine. I didn't care to find out. I heard a rising murmur from the crowd about how smelly the body was. I gasped. Miss Ludovine! I ran to the back of the house to the rusty gate. Again, the old woman was safe and sound, working in her garden. I found it odd to already be so attached to her. Minus the smell and crooked teeth, she reminded me of my grandmother who'd raised me. Relieved to see Miss Ludovine was safe, I turned to let her work, but heard her call out. Monsieur? Uh, hello, Miss Ludovine. How are you? I wanted to make sure you were safe. They be murdered like that sometime. Not worry, Samuel. I be strong. I I'm sure you are. Just so you know, I I'm sure the police are coming, so they might come over to talk to you. Mm, no, je ne pas la personne. She stepped inside without another word. I was fluent in French enough to understand she didn't want to speak to anyone. I bid goodbye to her closed door and headed home. I'd barely been inside when two policemen came calling with questions. We spoke briefly and I got the sense their appearance was all of formality. I managed to get in a question of my own, asking how the poor wretch had died. Blood loss, they said, and not the first on the island. I thanked the lawmen, then proceeded to get ready for my last day of work for the week. I wondered to myself if I'd stay in Guadalupe for the length of my contract. That night, after a hard day's work, I decided to head to the local dive to have a drink and meet people. If I was to spend five years in Lamentin, I had to make friends somehow. With a beer in hand, I played a game of pool with a few colleagues, then sat at the bar to watch a bit of soccer. The body found this morning, and those that had come before it, was the talk of the town. A subtle shift in the air signified the arrival of the beautiful woman I'd seen coming out of Miss Ludovine's house. Whistles and catcalls burst out from front to back of the bar, but the woman ignored them all to come sit by my side. I gave her a shy smile, swallowed hard, and mustered up my courage. Je pu vu uh, offrir toi un verre? Yes, you can buy me a drink. 
Mojito? I ordered her drink, along with stuffed crab pastries and boudin creole, and then turned to her. I, uh, I believe your mother is my neighbor, uh, Miss Ludovine? Ah, yes. She told me about you, said you were nice to her, offered her food. I did. <laughs> she, she's kind to me. I like knowing my neighbors. Hmm. She sipped her drink and observed me for a while, enough that I felt uncomfortable. As she watched me, I did the same, cataloging her willowy body, her curves, and the way the light shone on her ebony skin. Her plump lips made me want to kiss them until they were sore, her heavy breasts I wanted to worship until dawn. A clicking tongue brought me back out of my erotic reverie, and I looked into her shocking blue eyes. Uh, sorry, uh, it's not my style to stare this much, but uh, you're absolutely stunning. You're honest. I like that. She extended an elegant hand to me. I am Angelique. Pleased to meet you, Monsieur Samuel. I paused, but then realized Miss Ludovine must have told her my name. I shook her hand with a smile. A dance, perhaps? Mm, no. Too many stales here. Another place, another time, perhaps. Let's just have drinks and chat. Her refusal made me grin again, but the offer pleased me nonetheless. For hours until last call, we talked of everything and nothing, likes and dislikes. More than once, I had to contain a growing erection, but remained a gentleman, even when it was time to go home. She told me she'd sleep at her mother's, so we walked together, fingers occasionally touching, glances stolen in the night. Crickets chirping and singing birds filled the night air, along with the usual stench. And once we reached Miss Ludovine's house, I silently asked for a kiss. I found myself pressed against the door, her lips devouring mine as her hands roamed along my shoulders. She tasted sweet and briny, as if she'd had a swim in the ocean that afternoon. Even her skin felt as if she'd been in the sand, gritty but fine like salt. Angelique kissed me hard, then splayed her hands on my chest and licked my jaw, nipping at it. But the bite she took at my neck made me hiss in pain. My hands found her waist to gently push her back, seeing her eyes full of lust and her tongue licking her lips. Shall we go to my house? She shook her head, murmuring something I didn't understand, and gave me a quick kiss on the lips. Another time, another place. Meet me next Friday, the bar? Same time. And for a sweet, beautiful month, I did as she asked. We met for drinks and chats, Occasionally, she agreed to dance with me, only slow and smooth songs. I could see the looks of jealousy from other men. Every time I felt more and more possessive of her, even if we hadn't made this, whatever it was, official. Every Friday night, it ended with a rough makeout session by her door, leaving me breathless and more and more unsatisfied. Until one night. Meet me Sunday at five at Crescent Beach. I'll be there after church. We can have a picnic. It will be fun. I said yes immediately. But when the day finally came, Angelique wasn't there. I waited for a time, then sadly packed up the food I'd brought with me. I couldn't believe she had stood me up. I began walking along the beach, heading home, when I heard rustling in the bushes. It made me wonder if Angelique had finally arrived. So I went a little deeper into the forest around the beach. Angelique, darling, is that you? I've got everything with me. I walked further, deeper into the trees, 
Darkness closed around me as I hedged closer to the sound. Until finally I saw her. Angelique stood between an enormous silk tree. It was massive, with roots that crept across the ground and deep into the earth. She was bent over a gurgling man, her teeth sunk deep into his neck. It was horrifying, but I couldn't help staring as she avidly drank his blood. Coming to my senses, I began to quietly step back towards the beach. But a twig cracked loudly in the comb of the grove. In an instant, I was pinned to a tree. The woman I had pined after sniffing me, blood on her lips, her pupils dilated. Angelique, please, it's me, Samuel. Don't. She buried her nose in my neck. I could feel my pulse racing. She jumped back, her long hair swaying around her. Her eyes flicked up and down, back and forth, like a junkie hungering for a fix. As she screamed, her whole body violently shook, trembling until... She became a giant ball of fire. It soared off into the darkening sky, leaving me trembling alone in the clearing. I stood there staring up into the night for a long, long moment. What the fuck? Shaking my head, stumbling about, I went to check on the man, but it was too late for him. His skin was pale and his blood drained, like the ones found all over the island. It was then I remembered Miss Ludovine and sprinted through the trees, forgetting my backpack to check on the old woman's well-being. Whatever Angelique was, she could have hurt her mother, and I couldn't abide by that. When I reached the house, it was near dinner time, and I found Miss Ludovine on her porch suckling a stick of cinnamon. Hey there, Monsieur Samuel. You look like you've seen a phantom. I nodded, out of breath, and sat down heavily on the stairs. That red jungle fowl glared at me angrily as I shooed it away. In between deep breaths, trying not to gag at the smell, I'd told her what I'd seen. I ended simply by saying, Your daughter is... she's possessed by something. Nah, she not. You see something special. Listen, Monsieur Samuel. You've been witness to a succouillon. It comes in the night. Once you are under her magie, you'll never be the same. Succouillon is a devil creature who takes blood and mind. She still skin to live, skinwalker. So what I saw was n- n- not Angelique? Don't know. Be careful, Viston. She can kill you with her charms and teeth. Beautiful woman. Hungry woman. She look like God made an angel. But has the devil in her? Come into the night to feed. But it was broad daylight when I saw her. She be really hungry. Mad with it. Wait. Did you kiss her? More than once. Show me arms. Neck. I obeyed quickly. (coughs) And she spat at me when she saw the dark marks Angelique had left on my skin. Devil in you. She has you by the balls. I'm fine. I I promise. I won't see her again. She be doing dark magie at night. If you let her, she suck you dry. She did you already. Look at you. So, she's like a vampire? Nah. She used your blood for power. Basil. Basil? Stupid boy. Basil is a demon. Demon of death. 
live in the forest inside that big tree. As soon as she said big tree, I knew what tree she was talking about. The massive silk tree in the forest by the beach. The one with roots going deep enough to be as old as the island itself. She was near that tree when I saw her. Is there any way to get rid of her? I knew escaping the Sukuyon wouldn't happen a second time. And whatever I felt for Angelique, it wasn't real. You put her skin in grinder with salt. Big rocky salt. Grind, grind, grind until powder is left. Then burn it. If you don't, she can turn you. I took a moment to think. It didn't take long. I have to end this. Otherwise, who else could she kill? Will you help me get to her when she shows up again? Miss Ludovine pushed herself from her chair, <laughs> taking my hand with gratitude as she stood. Dark magic. I can help. We go tonight to the tree. We go together. She met me that night at the foot of her porch with a large sackcloth bag in her hand. I gave her a quizzical look. Weapon. I wasn't sure I could make it. Ever since that encounter in the forest, I'd felt my strength beginning to slip away. Out of breath, we finally reached the silk tree, the place where I expected Angelique to be. But when we arrived, Miss Ludovine and I were alone. She pulled her sack down and opened it, pulling out two clay pots. There was nothing to grind skin, no salt either. Miss Lud... I started as I heard the sound, but then the stench I knew from Miss Ludovine filled my nose. I lifted my head to see the old woman's body melting away. A suit of fat and pus that ran down her chest and legs, spreading in a pool across the ground. Running her hands through her hair, she emerged from the shell that was Miss Ludovine. The monster inside. Angelique. Too late, lover boy. You had your chance. It's... it's me. You like me, Angelique. Please, let me go. My... my blood isn't worth anything. I'm not special. As I spoke, I remembered her words. She kills from the inside. Turns you. I tried to shake off my fear. I'm here. I'm here to... Whatever I was about to say was gone as she was upon me. In a moment, she had me on the ground, straddling me, pinning me down. Mine. All mine. She leaned down, licking her lips. Her teeth sunk deep into my neck. I fought her hard, trying to kick and free my hands, but the hold she had on me was strong. I could feel myself letting go enthralled by this magnificent creature. Angelique, we have a connection. I, I know you feel it too. Y you can't deny it. Every time we kiss, I it's electric. <sighs> she pulled back, my blood on her lips. She looked down at me for a moment. Shut up. In her eyes, I saw the struggle. Deep down, there was still something human, if human she ever was. Angelique. It's me. You want me, I, I know that, but I want you too. We can be together. Make me like you. I tried to fight against this poison in my heart, but maybe, just maybe. You will be mine. Then Basil will give me everything I want. There was some sadness in her eyes. I saw it as she bent her head towards my neck once again. With the little breath I had left as she consumed me, I whimpered. I was what you wanted. No, Shiri. Blood is power. Your blood is all I need. I stared up through the boughs of the silk tree as I heard my blood pooling on the ground. 
The scream of a red jungle fowl was the last thing I heard. The Prey, written by C.M. Peters, with performances by E.K. Dagenfield as Samuel and Chantal Jean-Pierre as Angelique and Ludivine. The Man from Dome 33 was written by Michael Zenke, with performances by Alistair Mackey as Todd, Graham Rowett as Bob, Chantal Jean-Pierre as Alma, and Eddie Cooper as Beckett, and Jason Wilson as the Warden. Musical compositions by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management by Brooks Bigley. Videography by Hale Scherf. Audio engineering and sound design was by me, Jason Wilson. Well, thank you once again for completing the 13th episode of our season. Normally, this is where we would stop, but because of you, we have had the ability to extend our season and offer you twice as much entertainment. We really could not do this without all of you and our patrons. And we would like to take the time to thank our patrons once again, and to any of those who have taken time to leave us a five-star rating and a review. Those reviews keep us at the top of the charts and makes it easier for more tortured souls to find the show. Patrons like Aaron Anthony, Amy Nikolai, Arthur Unk, Diver Ellie, Ellie Dowell, Emily Cullen, Jackalbot Snows, Ronan Kumori, Jason Porras, Jeremiah Overstreet, Jessica Finch, Karina Sonina, The Kelly Bear, Kyle Wilcox, Laura Lupinetti, Lynn Browning, Megan Pruitt, Michael Velez, Mike Devine, Michael Philip BG, Paige Pye, Patrick Stewart, Plen Plen Plon, all night long. Sean Geary, Sean McCorkwadale, Shea Barbie, Sparky Anglin, Spirit Live, Stacy Thewis, Talicia Gallman, The Original Nick Show, and Teresa Tabor. The Gray Rooms is also streaming for free on Spotify. Just get the Spotify app or open the browser and, well, search The Gray Rooms. And you know, we here at The Gray Rooms love our fans and we want to give back to you in the best way we know how. We have lots of things to show you, and we hope that you like them. You can find out more by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and YouTube. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all the tortured souls who have passed through these rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your emotional needs. Don't forget about our merch store. It's full of epic designs and logos for you to sport showing the world you are a survivor of these very rooms. All of this can be found in the show notes or on our website at thegrayrooms.com. And also, if you would like to become a patron, feel free to stop on over to patreon.com forward slash thegrayrooms today and find a tier that fits right for you. And last but not least, I cannot forget to mention the lovely community on our Discord channel. Jump on in, join us today, and enjoy the chaos that does ensue. Now that we pass 13, let's move on to the next. With that, we have a lot more to do to be able to deliver high quality entertainment to your ears. So till next time, we'll see you next week. <laughs>